Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining our program on Optimum Canine Nutrition with Animate's president and founder, Robert Downey. For those of us who joined us last week, we do apologize for the technical challenges we had, but we're glad you're able to join us again tonight. And for those who are joining us for the first time, we hope you enjoy the presentation. My name is Greg Boyer, and I have the pleasure of working the operations team for Cherry Brook Pet Supplies. Rob started Animate Pet Foods in 1986 with a mission to develop holistic, natural, and American-made pet foods. His original goal was to provide optimum nutrition while providing or maintaining an eye towards the environment. Rob's lifelong involvement with dogs includes winning the limited North American Championship sled dog race in Alaska. His work in nutrition has been published in many veterinarian and nutritional journals, and his effects have been accredited forever changing the way modern endurance and performance dogs have been fed. Cherry Brook believes education is critical for pet owners to make informed decisions about nutrition. So we are delighted to offer this informative program like this to our customers. This presentation will be about 40 minutes long and Rob is happy to answer any questions you may have. So please use the chat bar to submit your questions throughout the presentation. Rob. All right, thanks, Greg. I'm truly honored to be here with you this evening and I wanna thank Greg and Cherry Brook for setting this up and making it all possible. We have really enjoyed doing business with Cherry Brook for so many years and truly appreciate working with a company that has the same commitment to nutrition that we do. And I also want to apologize to anybody that tried to watch this last Thursday uh, when I got cut off. And <clears throat> I have to tell you, I was totally unaware and con continued my talk until the end, not realizing that the only one that could hear me was my dog that was laying on the chair in my office. So again, I am sorry. And tonight should go much better as we have backup upon backup. But I've been involved in the pet industry for about 40 years, and hopefully in the next 40 minutes or so, you'll get a better understanding of how to maximize your pet's health and well-being throughout their life. <clears throat> to give you some of my background, I did my undergraduate at the Ohio State University, and then I spent seven years doing graduate work at the University of Pennsylvania School of Veterinary Medicine. A lot of my work's been published in peer-reviewed veterinary and nutrition journals as well as being cited in the NRC nutrient requirements of dogs and cats. I am the creator of Animate Pet Foods. I actually named the company after my mom, Anna Mae, who I no doubt got my love of animals from. In the picture, you will see me with Lee. He's an Australian cattle dog rescue that came from a shelter in North Carolina. He had actually been returned to the pound twice by the time he was a year and a half old. And then they tried to tried him in a foster home where he got kicked out of there as well. They actually decided that he was unadoptable and he was scheduled to be euthanized. When the North Carolina Australian Cattle Dog Rescue found him at the shelter and they sent him to us because of our background in dogs. And I'll have to say for the first five days or so, my wife and I thought maybe they were right and uh, he might have to be put down. Well. And that was over four years ago, and I have to, I'm proud to say that Lee goes everywhere with me, including to work every day. And I also can't remember the last time he was on a leash as he listens so well. Uh, we don't only rescue dogs, we also have three rescue cats. <clears throat> I was actually born and raised with dogs, and to be honest, it's all I've ever wanted to do is work with dogs. I'm actually more comfortable with a group of, of dogs than I am with people. But um, I grew up with German short hair pointers and English pointers. And then I went away to college and got involved in the sport of sled dog racing. And my first team was actually a ragtag bunch of rescue sled dogs that had some sort of behavioral or physical issue that made them available. And I really love working with these dogs as many of you that have rescued a dog from a shelter realize that how quick they respond with a little tender loving care. So. Um, I've always enjoyed that. I also remember the first one of the first things my dad told me about working with dogs. He said that uh, to train dogs, you have to be smarter than the dog you're working with. So he told me that I re should really stick with some pretty stupid ones. So uh, we've been fortunate enough to compete in sled dog races now for over 35 years. We've raced uh, from the Patagonia regions of the southern tip of South America. We've also raised in the Pyrenees Mount, raced in the Pyrenees Mountains of Spain. But the most enjoyable part of our career 
was the 20 years we competed in races in Alaska against the best competition in the world. Uh, every year, I would drive our dogs in the winter from our home in Pennsylvania to our cabin in the interior of Alaska, which the, the trip each way was about 4,200 miles each way. I recently did a series of lectures in the Czech Republic, and I was amazed to find out that it is actually less miles for me to travel from Philadelphia to Prague than from Philadelphia to Fairbanks. So um, it's quite a trip. But as Greg mentioned, the pinnacle of our racing career was winning the North American Championship in Fairbanks, Alaska. That helped us qualify for the World Championships in Northern Quebec, where we won a bronze medal for the US. I have since retired from sled dog racing, but I still really enjoy working with dogs. And currently I'm training a young Australian cattle dog for dock diving. And when he was little, we couldn't keep him out of the pool. And he has that cattle dog drive, all he wants to do is retrieve. So all I'm doing is simply combining his two loves. Someone asked me, what is the difference between training dock diving dogs and training sled dogs? And I thought for a minute and said, well, about 80 degrees. It certainly is much warmer to train dock diving dogs. <clears throat> so when you're trying to figure out what is the best pet food for your pet, you really need to consider what goes into pet foods. And one of the first things you need to consider is the processing. So what kind of product are you interested in? Is it going to be raw, baked, canned, freeze dried, you can have it extruded, or even now the newest one is air dried. Now, if the product is extruded or baked, you have to consider what temperature is it cooked at. For example, many of the bigger companies have big extruders, and because time is money, they can they run them at higher temperatures for shorter periods, often at 300 degrees. But at 300 degrees, you can destroy up to 60% of the vitamin A. Some companies, uh, like ours, actually do a lower temperature slow cook at about 200 degrees. It's sort of an artisanal production. And in that case, you lose only about 10% of the vitamin A, something that really can be easily adjusted with the inclusion rate. <clears throat> we actually test our vitamins pre-production, post-production. We also test it 16 months down the line. Not that we expect you to keep our food that long, but we want to make sure that it still has the right amount. So another thing you need to consider is the recipe. Is it a fixed formula recipe or a market-driven formula? Fixed formula means that every time you purchase that product, the recipe is going to remain exactly the same, the same amount of each ingredient, so it's very consistent. But you might be aware that some of the real cheaper versions product are actually market driven. And what that means is that the um, level of ingredients will change depends on the market price. So if the price of chicken goes up, they might lower the amount of chicken in the formula, might increase soy protein. So, um, you know, um, that's why you can get such variability in why a product will feed good one month and not good the next month, especially in the cheaper products. Finally, you need to consider what ingredients are in there. And you might be surprised to know that most ingredients come in at least four different quality levels. And they can have a significant effect on overall cost of the product. For example, if I take one of my actual recipes and strictly go to cheaper ingredients, I can cut between eight and $16 per bag my cost. And yet the ingredient list would remain exactly the same on the packaging. So it's really very difficult to read the label and determine nutritional quality. You need to also remember that in, like in any industry, there's going to be companies that are going to make uh, go as cheap as they can without any concern for quality. So for these bottom feeders, it's all about cost, certainly not quality. So be careful. Now, one of the <clears throat> newest problems in the pet industry is the infusion of venture capital money. And they have purchased a lot of uh, good family-run companies. And one of the things we learned in the recession of 2008 is that the Pet industry is recession proof. People will cut the budget of their families before they cut the budget of their pets. So venture capital money has been thrown around all the time in the pet industry. In fact, I will bet you twice a month, 
uh, our company is contacted by somebody at a venture capital firm looking to invest money in our products. Something that we totally disagree with. But one of the problems with venture capital is that once they take over these companies, oftentimes they're looking to cut the costs. And, and uh, that can really be at your pet's expense. And to give you a perfect example of that, I have a friend who sells uh, ingredients in the pet industry. He sells vitamins and minerals. And a company he used to bid vitamins and minerals for, family-run company, he would have to list the vitamin, he would have to list the shelf life of that vitamin, he'd have to list the purity level of that vitamin, if there's any preservatives, and of course, what country it is originated from. Now that this company's been taken over by a VC firm with new marketing or new management, <clears throat> Now all he gets to do on the vitamins, he gets a list of vitamins and all he can put in there is price. They don't want to know anything about quality, they just want to buy price. So you got to be careful. Um, the pet industry is really changing and it's due in large part to the humanization of pets. And it wasn't that many years ago that 90% of pet owners in the United States couldn't tell the difference from the best pet food in the world to the worst pet foods because quite frankly, they weren't thinking about things like coat, stool quality, or life expectancy of their pet. Well, currently now in the United States, 95% of dog and cat owners consider their pets to be an essential part of the family like children. So owners are much more concerned with the health and well-being of their beloved pets, especially the quality of ingredients. So we have also seen a, transi a transition in the industry from feeding all life stage foods to more uh, age specific foods. And of course this all starts with puppy foods and the first puppy foods actually appeared in the early 60s as dogs and cats became part of the uh, big part of the family. <clears throat> also many owners really have a hard time wrapping their heads around a concept where you feed the same diet from puppyhood to senior citizen status. Puppy foods got a further boost in 2012 when the American Veterinary Medical Association released a study showing that nearly 40% of the all life stage foods in the grocery store were found to have too much calcium for large and giant breed puppies. So veterinarians are now recommending feeding puppy foods and not all life stage formulas to puppies. And also puppy foods provide a simpler concept for the consumers. Puppies grow rapidly and they're building bone and muscle <clears throat> and developing organs. Adults, on the other hand, are maintaining their bodies. Your puppy needs extra nutrients to fuel this growth. EPA and DHA are two of the principal omega-3 fatty acids, which are an essential part of normal metabolism. And research has shown that DNA, DHA uh, supports brain development. In fact, you can actually increase brain development with higher levels of DHA. And also they're, they're great for helping with skin and coat. And some studies have gone as far as to show that puppies fed high levels of DHA are easier to train and socialize. So these omega-3 fatty acids are not produced in the body. So they must be consumed through the diet. Because of this, they're referred to as essential fatty acids. Puppies grow on a bell-shaped curve. And so you can accelerate that growth curve by increasing the caloric density. In other words, by feeding too high of a protein, too high of a fat. And so this overfeeding tends to accelerate that growth curve. And basically what happens is they become too big, too young. And this puts a stress on the skeletal system. It allows the bones to grow too fast and it leads to improper calcification and metabolic bone disease. Overweight puppies are another concern as well. So the point here is it's not necessary to have the biggest and heaviest puppy in the litter. In fact, I'm all the time arguing with people, especially Rottweiler people or Great Dane people or, or uh, uh, staffy people that they want to have the biggest, heaviest pup at six months, and it's just not healthy. Let them grow at their own pace. Calcium levels in large breeds is another concern. 
Um, in fact, they've now, AFCO has limited the calcium level for large, large size puppies to 1.8%. So that means any dog, any puppy that's going to be 70 pounds or greater as, as a mature and lean adult should not get over 1.8% calcium. On the other hand, for all other size puppies, and once they became, once they become mature, um, the growth formulas can be as high as 2.5% calcium. The problem is that this information is hard to find on a bag, right? The, uh, calcium levels are not in the guaranteed analysis. So you really need to look for a nutritional adequacy statement on the back of the package. And so you will see on the back of a package, it'll say the name of the product, it'll say it's formulated to meet the nutritional levels established by AFCO nutrient profiles for all life stages and then it'll say in parentheses, including growth for large size dogs, 70 pounds or more as an adult. So you, you know that that product will have under 1.8% calcium. Actually, if, if, if it was up to me, I would have limited the, pro, the calcium level to 1.5. I don't think any of them need over 1.5%. The other thing I wanna caution you on is be careful with the feeding instructions is they can be very misleading. They're only really a starting point for most dogs and most dogs will vary from them. And I often when a dog stops eating the food, especially a puppy, it's not because they don't like the taste of the food, it's usually because they're being overfed. One of the first things you learn in nutrition is that a normal healthy dog won't starve himself because he doesn't like the taste of the food. So what I'm saying here is, Oftentimes when a dog stops eating, it just doesn't need that many calories. And, and so that those feeding instructions are really a starting point. And let's compare it. If you take a litter of seven puppies and raise them to adulthood, you're going to find one, one dog in that litter will need 40% more calories than the average of the litter. And one dog in that litter will need 40% less calories than the average. So you could literally have two dogs in the same litter one that's gonna need twice as much as the other. And so a pet food company is really gonna gear their feeding instructions towards a hard keeper. Because if you geared them towards the easy keeper that needs half as much, that hard keeper could literally starve, get skinny, and you could be liable. If you gear it towards a hard keeper and you have an easy keeper, the worst that's gonna to happen to the easy keeper is he's either gonna stop eating or he's gonna get heavy. So um, it's really, you, you'll find it very difficult in most cases to feed as much as the packaging suggests without them getting heavy. So take that into consideration. Remember, those are strictly a starting point. And as I mentioned, unlike people, dogs tend to eat to their caloric needs. In fact, when, I, when somebody tells me that their dog stopped eating, I would almost bet the farm that that dog's overweight. That's usually the case. You gotta remember that dogs evolved from wolves and they only ate every three to five days. And now, now are we not only feeding them once a day, most of the time we're feeding them multiple times a day. So it's not too hard to, to overfeed your dog. Quality of ingredients. One of the most important things I would like you to take from this is that pets don't require ingredients, they require nutrients. People get too caught up on the ingredients when they should be worried about what nutrients are in those ingredients. And as I mentioned, each ingredient comes in at least four different quality levels. So when you're looking on that packaging and you're looking at that ingredient list, you really wanna look for specific term ingredients. A term like fish meal is very general. In other words, fish meal could be salmon meal one week and it could be tilapia the next. Same way with something like poultry fat. It could be chicken, turkey, or duck. But if it says chicken fat, it has to be from a chicken. So look for specific term, term ingredients. Also, byproduct meal. So for instance, poultry byproduct meal. Poultry byproduct meal can include beaks, feet, and feather meal. If it's just poultry meal, it can't have any of that. So please distinguish the term between meal and byproduct meal. The term meal is actually a processing term where the moisture has been removed. So evaluating by level can really lead to problems. 
also products coming from Europe. In Europe, they don't use the term meal. So chicken is called chicken, whether it is fresh, dehydrated or meal. And some companies that are using dehydrated and meal as the same thing, call it just chicken. I can't talk about optimum pet nutrition without discussing the importance of vitamins and minerals. Studies have shown that appropriate levels of vitamins and minerals in your pet's diet have been associated with increased longevity and a decrease in overall health issues. So this is especially critical if you decide to do your own home prepared or raw diet. Before the pandemic, I was fortunate enough to travel all around the world talking about pet nutrition. And often after the talk, someone would come up to me and proudly say, they don't feed commercial dog food, they do home cooking for their pet. And when I ask them, what are they doing for vitamins and minerals? They get a blank look on their face like, oh gosh, I guess I didn't think of that. So <clears throat> I've worked with two board certified veterinary nutritionists. We've actually formed formulated a vitamin mineral supplement to simply balance your pet's home prepared or raw diet. And this will provide critical nutrients to prevent the most common deficiencies. And home prepared diets are definitely growing in the marketplace, but studies have shown that 60% of home prepared diets are deficient in at least one nutrient. And also who's balancing these formulas, especially the vitamins and minerals because most veterinarians are not trained to balance a diet for vitamins and minerals. In fact, only about half the veterinary teaching universities even have a core nutrition course. You don't go to a human doctor about nutrition. I'm not sure why people think that their veterinarian should also be a nutritionist. Think about what they have to learn. Not only do they have to learn surgery and medicine, they have to do it in so many species, large animals, small animal, cats, birds, dogs, and they're dealing with a patient that can't tell them what is wrong. So do you think they have time to learn that much about nutrition? It just, it honestly just doesn't happen like you think it does. Raw diets. <clears throat> Many raw diets are not considered complete and balanced and may need additional vitamins and minerals. And many of the raw diets that are labeled complete and balanced are made to have just over AFCO minimums for vitamins and minerals because they're so expensive to begin with keeping the cost down by not adding too much. So supplementing some vitamins and minerals to these formulas may be a good idea as well. So why are vitamins so important? There was a study um, a few years ago where they followed 2000 beagles for 15 years. And these were dogs that lived in the home, so these weren't rescue dogs. Um, they were randomly assigned to one of four diets. And the only thing different in the diet was vitamin levels. They had, um, they were either low vitamin, medium vitamin, high or extra high vitamins. So they followed them for 15 years. You can imagine how hard this was with them living in the homes. A lot of them they lost just simply people quit using the diets or whatever, but they were still able to maintain 60% of them for the entire 15 years, which I think is quite remarkable. But how amazing is this? They found on the dogs that were fed extra high vitamins, they lived 23% longer than the dogs that were on average vitamin supplementation. They found that the dogs on extra high vitamin levels had 29% less veterinary visits than the dogs that were on average vitamin supplementation. And the tumor incidence was 32% lower when dogs were on extra high vitamins compared to average vitamin supplementation. And of the tumors they did have, they were 130% less likely to be cancerous. So it just shows you how important vitamins can be in your dog's diet. Now the sad part is, when they tested pet foods on the market, they found that less than 5% of the foods they tested had extra high vitamins. And why is that? Well, to be honest, I think it is because many just don't understand how important vitamins are. And often companies don't even have a nutritionist on staff. And to be honest, quality, quality vitamins are very expensive. In fact, when I first started in the pet industry over 40 years ago, 
companies were spending millions of dollars to find out how low they can go in vitamin levels before you saw clinical deficiency. And now because so many people are concerned about their pet's health, and you see this humanization of pets, that in the last 15 years, vitamin supplementation in pet foods has gone up by 30%. Now, what about minerals? Chelated minerals, chelated actually means protected. We actually protect ours with a protein molecule. So for example, you'll see zinc proteinate or copper proteinate. These are the chelated forms. They're also the organic form. You can also chelate them by attaching a gluconate or an acetate molecule. But the bottom line is chelated minerals strengthen the immune system, improve hair coat quality. They've actually been shown to increase litter size, not that we need bigger litters, but also they're eight times better absorbed, uh, the chelated minerals in the inorganic forms. So what are the inorganic forms? The inorganic forms, when you see them on the label, would be the oxides and sulfates. So you, you're, an example would be zinc oxide or copper sulfate. Whereas the chelated minerals are actually the organic form. But the inorganic forms have also been shown to have a negative effect on the antioxidant capacity of the product. Thus, they can actually shorten the shelf life of the product. So why do some companies use the inorganic form at all? Simply price. Chelated minerals are much more expensive. Some companies will actually use a combination. They'll use chelated minerals and non-chelated or inorganic. And why do they use both? Well, they can use the chelated minerals in their marketing, yet cut the cost by including the oxides and sulfates as well. So be careful. I'm a firm believer in joint supplements. They really can make a difference. The original work was done in the 50s in Australia, and they were feeding shark chondroitin. And actually, they weren't thinking it would, for joints, they actually thought it would be helping with heart conditions. So they fed these uh, people in Australia for several months, and after they went back and they checked on them, they found that their heart conditions weren't any better, but they're all moving around easier, and thus this became the uh, origin of the, of the joint supplement industry. And in pets, the original thought process was if you put your old dog on a joint supplement, you may be able to ease the pain as they age. But the current research indicates now if you start a dog on a joint supplement when they're young, it can prevent problems when they are old. We actually have been using joint supplements on our sled dogs for many, many years, and we found that we had less injuries during the season, and they actually had an extended athletic career. In other words, they would, they would last about two years longer uh, as a competitive athlete when they're on a joint supplement. So it really can make a difference in the health of your dog. The problem is that these joint supplements are a dime a dozen and the price levels are all over the place. So simply stated, not all joint products work, so be careful what you purchase. I am really a firm believer in joint supplements, as I mentioned. But now many companies are moving away from using shark chondroitin as sharks are becoming an endangered species. And with growing concerns in the pet industry about sustainability and preserving our natural resources, you will see more and more efforts like this. So what ingredients do you see? Well, I mentioned chondroitin sulfate. It's actually a building block of cartilage. And um, we suggest about 700 milligrams a day for a 50 pound dog. Glucosamine hydrochloride helps enable joints to hold back more moisture, increasing joint flexibility. And we like that at about 1,000 milligrams a day for a 50 pound dog. Green lip muscle is a natural anti-inflammatory that is also a rich source of amino acids and, uh, amino acids and fatty acids. And we suggest that at about 1,000 milligrams a day for a 50 pound dog. You see a lot that uh, promote MSMs, but to be honest, I've seen no clinical evidence that MSMs work in dogs. You often hear uh, about glucosamine hydrochloride as opposed to, I mean, we, we talk about, we use glucosamine hydrochloride, but you also hear about glucosamine sulfate. Interesting thing is glucosamine sulfate is actually absorbed better, but there's been no studies published showing that glucosamine sulfate appears in synovial tissue after it's been ingested orally. Bottom line is a joint supplement doesn't help 
if it doesn't get where it needs to be. What about glucosamine and chondroitin and kibble? Well, really you gotta remember that heat has a significant effect on both. So how much is available to your pet after production? Another problem is, as I mentioned earlier, you need about 1,000 to 1,500 milligrams in some of these dogs. So you really need to add a lot. So for the inclusion rates to provide a therapeutic level in the final product, it would really make it cost prohibitive. So the products on the market that are using glucosamine and, and uh, chondroitin, basically are, you're getting about 20 to 50% of the necessary dosing. So supplementation is still needed. When you're looking at supplements, how can you tell if they're any good? One of the things you might look for is this logo, NASC. It's the National Animal Supplement logo. It's really the gold standard for uh, supplements. When you see that NASC quality seal on a product, you can trust it comes from a reputable member company that has passed an independent facility audit and complies with NASC's rigorous standards of quality. For instance, we have an annual plant inspection. We're required to buy our raw materials from NASC certified suppliers. The other thing is NASC goes out during the year, buys your product at retail, sends it out to an independent laboratory to be um, analyzed. And then um, they send you the bill uh, for the testing and the supplement to make sure that, you know, so that you know that you're putting in there, they're seeing what you're putting in there. So in other words, if I say I'm putting in a thousand milligrams of glucosamine, uh, they'll test to make sure there's a thousand milligrams. It's really pretty, um, pretty serious testing. So it's also the toughest certification we ever had. Our original document was 120 pages long. And, um, they also have a scientific conference where we must attend. So looking for NASC logo on your label is actually a pretty good idea. Obesity is the number one health problem in dogs today and mimics the trends we find in humans. Over 50% of dogs and 40% of cats in the U.S. are obese. Problem is only 20% of their owners realize it. And I will tell you from experience, be real careful telling somebody their pet's overweight. I was in a retail store a couple years ago and a woman came in with a King Charles Spaniel and to me it looked like a tick. And when I mentioned to her that I thought her dog was overweight, she went ballistic. So you gotta really be careful. Bottom line is lean dogs and cats live longer and healthier lives. In fact, obesity can shorten a dog's lifespan by two years. And currently in the United States, there's over 100 million, million dogs and cats in the US that are obese. So weight issues can increase many health concerns, everything from pancreatitis to diabetes, disc disease, hip dysplasia, ruptured cruciate ligaments, compromised immune system. In fact, in the United States last year, there was over $1 billion of ruptured cruciate ligament surgery done in dogs alone. So, uh, and many of those are due to weight issues. So what do you look for in a diet for your overweight dog? Higher protein because it increases satiability. In other words, you're going to feel fuller longer eating protein than you will carbohydrates that decrease satiability. Also, you want low fat. You need to remember there's twice the amount of calories per gram of fat as there is in a gram of protein or carbohydrates. So it really becomes calories in versus calories out. Also, additional oil carnitine, which is used in the body to help with fat metabolism. It also helps maintain lean muscle mass and also additional omega-3 fatty acids, which are known to reduce inflammation and improve vascular function. There are a large number of pet food formulas out there claiming to help with weight loss. So how do you decide which would be the best for your dog or your cat? Actually, one of the simplest ways is reading the name of the product. If you see a product called Lean, light, light like in Miller light, or low calorie, these are descriptive terms as approved by AFCO. This requires the formula to be low in fat or have low calories per kilogram. It also requires that you list the range of fat in the product. So you, mu you must list not only a minimum amount of fat, 
which you see in all products, but you also have to list the maximum amount of fat in the diet. So other names are just not approved by AFCO. So when you see a formula with names like healthy weight, fit and trim, weight control, or weight management, these are not AFCO approved descriptive terms. So these diets can have any amount of calories or any amount of fat. Products with these names are only required to list the minimum amount of fat. So you really need to do your homework. We looked at about 20 of these weight loss formulas and we found that the fat levels were all over the place. For example, a lean diet for dogs, in other words, a diet called lean, allows the maximum fat to be 9%. We actually saw one formula called healthy weight whose minimum fat level was 15%. Just showing the minimum, so we have no idea how high the max was. And some do list the minimum and max. We actually found a weight management formula that listed the minimum facts at 11 and the maximum fat at 15. So um, again, you really need to do your homework. I've mentioned AFCO a couple times. What is AFCO? AFCO is the American or the Association of American Feed Control Officials. It's actually a voluntary membership uh, association of federal, federal, state, and local agencies empowered by law to regulate the sale and distribution of the pet foods. AFCO creates and defines the regulations for ingredients in pet foods. They establish requirements for nutritional adequacy. And purely uh, purchasing AFCO approved diets isn't a bad way to start, but to be honest, a lot of quality foods really go above and beyond providing adequate nutrition. In fact, ultimately, optimum nutrition is a goal for all of us. I also want you to be aware when you're trying to lose weight with your dog, watch out for the treats. When feeding a low calorie diet, you should also feed low calorie treats. Many treats are calorie bombs, so think lean. Well, we've spoken about puppies, overweight dogs, and supplements. I thought I would briefly mention older dogs as well, as seniors are certainly a growing segment in the dog population. And our pets are living longer and longer, so we're starting to see increase in geriatric maladies. So nutraceuticals like turmeric and coconut oil have been shown to help slow the aging process. Turmeric is a powerful natural anti-inflammatory that has shown promise in alleviating the clinical signs associated with arthritis. Coconut oil, which is a rich source of medium chain triglycerides and blends real well with turmeric, is known for, um, for its anti-aging properties. It helps with age-associative cognitive decline. We often hear about protein in older dogs. Do older dogs need protein, more protein or less? I, virtually all current research indicates that as dogs age, they need more protein, not less. And this against this goes against the age-old theory that you should restrict protein in older dogs. Some companies still promote lower protein. Why? Well, I can tell you that the single most costly ingredient in the product is quality protein. So if a company can convince you to use a lower protein, they can actually increase their bottom line. One disclaimer. If your dog has kidney disease, you need to restrict protein. But a higher protein levels does not cause kidney disease. So older dogs utilize protein um, or need more protein on a calorie basis than when they're young. And like older people, dogs utilize it less efficiently than they do when they're young. They're also more susceptible to stress. And we all know that stress depletes body proteins. Also, the neurotransmitters in the brain that keep you mentally sharp are protein based. So if you restrict protein, you can actually increase senility. And they've actually done studies in humans to see this. Also, as we age, we lose muscle and muscle is largely protein. So studies again have shown that if you lower protein too much in a diet, you can actually increase muscle wasting. So you really need to keep the protein levels up, especially for seniors. So when do dogs become seniors? Well, it's a difficult, uh, this is a difficult question, as some breeds have an average lifespan of only five to seven years, whereas other breeds may live to 14 to 16 years. But most experts agree that when your dog reaches six years, 
old, you can start them on a senior formula. But the bottom line is a well-formulated senior diet can optimize your dog's health during the aging process, helping maintain a higher quality of life for your dog. So in end, I can just say that we can certainly help them all live longer with good optimal science-based nutrition. And now uh, Greg will open it up for questions. Sounds great, thanks Rob. All right, first question is, uh, at what age should I start giving my dog joint supplements? That's actually a good question. There's really been no, sur uh, uh, I've not seen any studies to show that you really need to be doing it with puppies. So we always suggest to wait till they're at least one year before we put them on a joint supplement. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, what brand of joint supplement do you recommend? And can you give human uh, glucosamine uh, conjointin to them, I'm assuming? Yeah, well, of course, the brand I recommend is the one we make because we've done all the testing, and it's called Animate Endure. And all of our all of our ingredients in there are human grade. But yeah, you could use a human one. Just make sure you check out the dosage. Okay. Um, what vitamin supplement sources are you comfortable with? Uh, the one that we use for um, the one that we formulated for. Uh, home prepared or raw diets is a product uh, we just released called Enhance, Animate Enhance. And you can use it. Uh, it balances home prepared diets. It also balances uh, non-balanced raw diets. And it can also even help out. Uh, you can use it uh, half dose with, with diets that are raw that uh, might have some vitamins and minerals in it. But I think that if one thing people take away from this is how important I think vitamins are, and I've had so many people that have said that going to these higher levels of vitamins has made such a difference in their dog's uh, life. So, um, How long does my puppy have to be on puppy food? Typically um, 9 to 12 months. You know, I would also depends on the size of the dog the more giant breed i'd be a little more careful taking them off puppy foods right smaller breeds you can you can transition the biggest thing is find out the calcium level and you should be able to call your pet food company or look on their website and find out what there is because basically the difference between puppy foods and many other uh foods for different ages also comes down to calcium level so it's a if it's a very high calcium Diet, if it's over 1.8, you don't want to start a puppy on that till uh, they're probably closer to a year old. Okay. Uh, next question. Should I switch uh, my senior uh, brand since my dog is turning six? Can you mix lean and senior to maintain weight? Yes, you can. Yeah. I mean, the bottom line is if you're starting off with two um, diets that are complete and balanced, you can mix them and you're still going to have a complete and balanced diet. What you're doing by adding the lean is cutting down on the fat that you'll find in the senior diet. So you might find that blending them will work. Okay. Uh, next question. I have an 11 and a half year old lab pit mix uh, feeding them senior uh, lamb meal. She used to eat in the morning and the afternoon, now only seeking to uh, eat once a day. Should I eliminate one feeding? Is there a geriatric formula? Uh, no, there's not a geriatric formula. I think that what happens is, just like in humans, our, the dog's metabolism slows down, and they just tend to eat less, right? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of dogs aren't going to necessarily want to eat twice a day, and cutting them to one day, one, one meal a day isn't certainly the end of the world. The other thing is you can just cut back. If you prefer to feed them uh, twice a day, just cut back and give them a very small portions twice a day. But feeding them simply once a day is not 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 a bad thing. They're just not tending to eat as much, especially the senior diets. A lot of them tend to have a little more protein, and when you get a little more protein, they tend to get a little more fat. So they're they can be um, uh, not highly energy dense, but they. 
they can carry a good bit of calories, so you might not need, need to feed them much. But again, some of this gets back to reading the feeding labels on the bag. You read that this size dog should get two and a half cups and you can only get one and a half cups in there and it scares you, right? Where most dogs wouldn't be able to feed two and a half cups. In fact, if I wasn't required by law to put feeding instructions on the back of a package, I wouldn't do it because they're so hard to, to get right. They're purely just starting points. The biggest thing is look at the weight of your dog. If your dog's losing weight, that's a concern. But um, I actually don't think it's a bad idea to, uh, to weigh your dogs on a, on a regular basis. I will tell you that it's really hard to determine weight just by looking at them because some dogs, their hair coats are different. Some are very long and it's hard to see what, uh, what weight they're carrying. The other thing is if you're trying to determine the weight of the dog, one of the best ways to do it is rub your finger along the spinal processes, the tips of the backbone back towards the tail. If, you're, if your hands are running along and you're not feeling any tips of those spinal processes and all you're feeding is, is skin, those dogs, that dog's too fat. If your hands are going up and down and you feel nothing but those spinal processes, chances are it's too thin. It's really difficult to judge a dog's weight by the feeling their ribs that so many people want to do. Okay. Are there any supplements you shouldn't be giving to a uh, pregnant dog? Any uh, supplements you should not, not be giving? I honestly don't know. The, the difficult part about that is supplements out there can carry so many different nutrients and so many different nutrient levels, right? So I don't know all the supplements out there. So I'd be a little cautious feeding a pregnant bitch some of these supplements out there because you don't know um, what's in them, right? I mean, what levels are in them. Doing a complete and balanced diet and um, making sure you're getting it that way might be the way to go. So be careful supplementing because uh, I guess I'm. this is really hard. I'm, I'm not trying to be vague. It's just that there's some supplements out there that I've looked at the label and I think, God, I don't know that I sh that anybody should be feeding this thing, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, next question, what are prebiotics? Uh, actually, that's a really good question. Probiotics are the good bacteria in your gut, right? Mm -hmm. And those probiotics help establish a great microbiome. And we all are reading about the microbiome. The microbiome, um, you're looking for a good microbiome, it's good gut health. And you need to understand that 80% of your immune system is located in your gut. So you want good uh, probiotics, the good bacteria. But what they feed off of is called prebiotics. So prebiotics are what the good bacteria in your gut feed off of. And so a good source would be like chicory root or uh, uh, fructooligosaccharides. Even to some extent, beet pulp could be considered a prebiotic. The difficult part is every person man, woman, child, dog, cat, has a, set, has a different microbiome. So the bacteria in my gut are going to be the different uh, than some of the bacteria in your gut. So it's very difficult to feed the right probiotic to every person. I'd actually prefer, I think it's more important, the prebiotics you add to a diet to, to uh, help grow the, the, the good bacteria that's normal in your gut. The problem is when you start to take something like an antibiotic, it can really um, affect your gut health and the microbiome and the bacteria in your gut. And once you start doing that, you can start to get all kinds of health issues, everything uh, from IBD or inflammatory bowel disease to um, they're even thinking that some cancers could be caused by that. So um, it's good to, to feed a healthy microbiome. It's so important. And a good prebiotic is, is key to that. Okay. Uh, next one is our small, uh, more frequent meals better for senior dogs. Um, here's the here's the thing you should remember: digestibility is a function of intake. So you're going to digest smaller meals eaten more frequently than one big meal. See what I mean? So um, your dog, your senior dog. If you feed them three smaller meals 
will digest that better than if you just give them all three of those meals in one sitting because digestibility is a function of intake. So I actually don't think that's a bad idea. Okay. Can you recommend the best dog foods for uh, best foods for dogs with severe skin allergies? Uh, well, I mean, as far as our brand, we like to go with Animate Aqualuck, which is a, a grain-free fish-based formula because not only does it have uh, fish in there, which is a great source of omega-3 fatty acids, but it also has algae in it, which is a sustainable source of omega-3 fatty acids. So you're really looking for something uh, without, for allergies with higher levels of omega-3 fatty acids because of the anti-inflammatory properties. Something else about omega-3 fatty acids. Um, as I mentioned, um, a lot of people like to get omega-3 fatty acids from fish oil. What people don't realize is fish don't actually produce omega-3 fatty acids. They get it from the algae they eat, right? So what we've decided as a company, instead of using up all the fish oils, why not go to the source and use algae, right? Because algae is not only completely sustainable, you can grow algae anywhere, but it's also very stable. In other words, part of the reason they tell you to keep fish oils refrigerated is that they oxidize, but algae doesn't. And so if I put fish oils, if I use, uh, you know, DHA, one of the principal omega-3 fatty acids, if I put that in the form of algae in a product and I test it 12 months down the line, you're going to still have 99% of the DHA in there. But if I'm using fish oils for DHA, I test it 12 months down the line, you're actually going to be less than 50%. One more thing about allergies. Food allergies are typically not developed in a dog till they're four or five years old, right? And so when you see an allergy in a puppy, they tend to be more environmental or seasonal allergies. And if a puppy has a real true food allergy, chances are its immune system was compromised when it was very, very young. So you might get a rescue dog where the um, immune system was compromised, and then it could have a food allergy. But typical, typically food allergies don't develop till they're four or five years old, right? So, um, you know, be aware of that. Um, you know, the other thing is if you're going to do allergy testing, be careful about uh, blood tests for food allergies because we're starting to see a lot of false positives on those. So. Okay. Uh, next question. What do you about? Th uh, what do you think about giving goat's milk, kefir, and hemp, salmon, and flaxseed oil? Um, hemp. I'm not allowed to touch in the pet food industry. You can use it in supplements. So I know some people that use it in supplements, and it works well. Um, I think all those things have their place. Absolutely no doubt. Say that again, goat's milk? Goat's milk, kefir, uh, and hemp, salmon, mm -hmm. and flaxseed oil. Yeah, I mean, um, I've certainly worked a lot with salmon and flaxseed oil, and they work great. I, I really haven't done enough. I, I haven't worked with goat's milk, so um, I'm not one to ask that question to. Sorry. Okay. Next question. I have a six-year-old Aussie mix and want to trim her down due to iliapsolus strain uh what would you recommend say that again i have a six-year-old aussie mix and want to trim her down due to illy absolute strain i'm not familiar with the term myself but what would you recommend okay i think um i'm a companion animal nutritionist we also have on staff a board certified veterinary nutritionist so in other words he's a veterinarian he's also got his phd in nutrition that would be a great question if they if you could have them email it to me sure. and then I could pass it on to him. I am not a veterinarian and I I don't think I should be answering those kind of questions, but I'd be more than happy to get her an answer or him an answer. So please, please send it to us. Will do. Is kefir a prebiotic or a probiotic? Pre. Pre. Okay. Next question, where does omega-3 fatty acid come from? Well, as I mentioned, um, algae 
principally. I mean, obviously, fish, a lot of fish people using fish oils to get omega-3 fatty acids. But fish don't produce omega-3 fatty acids. They get it from the algae they eat. That's why farm-raised fish is lower in omega-3 fatty acids. You hear that all the time. Because quite frankly, they're not living in, in wide open areas where they have access to algae, right? The interesting thing is 80% of the fish oils produced on this planet actually go back into aquaculture. So they go back into being fed to farm-raised fish to increase their omega-3 fatty acid levels, right? Which I think is really kind of crazy. That's why we have made the switch to using algae in going to the source of omega-3 fatty acids, right? Is that making it clear? In other words, you can get, you can get omega-3 fatty acids from fish, you can get it from algae, but I mean, to me, it's, I think it's better to go to the source. What I'm saying is that fish don't produce omega-3 fatty acids. They get it from the algae they eat. Okay. All right. Um, if you're feeding once a day, would you leave kibble in a bowl on the floor, or should you pick up the bowl after 15 minutes? Um, that's called free feeding, and that really depends on your dog, right? If, if your dog just likes to casually go back and pick at it throughout the day, there's really nothing wrong with that. What you got to be careful about is making sure that that bowl gets cleaned at some point and you're not leaving it out there and just pouring new food on it and, and bacterial contamination, right? But there's some dogs that are just good at free feeding and they'll just go back and casually eat as they wish. Now, problem with that is if you have little kids around, that's not necessarily going to work because you're going to find your dog's not going to get as much as you think. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I don't necessarily have a problem with that. Now, I will say that some of my sled dogs, you know, if I put food down, it will be gone in five seconds. If I kept putting it down, they'd just keep eating. <laughs> All right, next question. Is it okay to give your dog homemade bone, uh, bone broth? Yeah, yeah. But, again, that's what I'm talking about when you start to add calorie um, – uh, start to add things that are not not balanced with vitamins and minerals. Adding something like enhanced that we talk about might be a great way to balance it. Okay. Uh, can dogs break down carbohydrates? Absolutely, absolutely. There's a, you need to understand that dogs really um, were the first animals ever domesticated by humans. They're actually domesticated before we, they did any other uh, farm animals or even plants. They domesticated dogs. And so that was back in the Paleolithic era about 30,000 years ago. And one of the things that, and so they've evolved tremendously over that time. And you need to remember that dogs, um, because they can be, their you know, generational turnover is much quicker. They can evolve quicker. And one of the ways that we, or the way that we break down starches is actually through the amylase gene. Now, we all know that dogs evolved from wolves. Well, they actually did a pretty good study in Sweden several years ago where they compared the DNA of wolves to the DNA of various breeds. And one of the ways, as I mentioned, we evolve as a species is that we duplicate genes, right? And so they actually tested wolves versus dogs and they found now that dogs have now developed over seven times the amount of amylase genes that a wolf does. So although their DNA is very similar, their, their, their ability to break down starches has, has grown to where they're a point where they're basically a pseudo-omnivore, right? And they've also done studies where they measured the blood glucose. And they found that the blood glucose on a dog fed high carbohydrate is not significantly different than a dog fed high protein or high fat. So this idea that dogs can't break down starches is really um, kind of old school antiquated and, and not current. Okay, uh, next question. How much should I feed my Aussie who is a little overweight and needs to trim up? Is two cups a day uh, okay or a little less? That's the difficult thing. I would actually need to know the weight of the dog. Um, 
I would think that two cups for an Aussie, well, of course, it also depends on the diet, right? How much protein and fat you're putting in there. If they want to, if they want to email that to me, I can give them a recommendation based on their resting energy requirement. But just looking at it, it seems to me that two cups would be a lot for an Aussie that's overweight. Okay, uh, next one. How much turmeric or uh, and coconut oil mixture would you give to an 82-pound old English sheepdog uh, that is 17 months old? Uh, I'd have to do some calculations on that. Can can that? Can you write? Can they? Send that yeah, to I'll me? provide you all the questions afterwards. Yeah. We can reach out to them. Yeah, probably. I mean, I don't want to. My math skills are diminished as I've aged. I need to re rely on technology. <laughs> uh, do you uh, use a raised feeder or feed on the floor? I feed on the floor, and I've always fed on the floor. <laughs> And I, I know people that use the race thing, but I, I honestly have not uh, had the problem. But, you know, I mean, the dogs I, I've been feeding more recently, the Australian catalogs, and for many, many years, the short hairs and then the sled dogs, um, feeding them on the floor was, was fine with those. I, I, I'm not against race feeders. I'm just saying that that's never been an issue for us. Our next one, uh, what are the differences between Aqu Aqualuck uh, Rejuvenate and Senior? Which is best for my eight-year-old? Which would you rec for my, uh, recommend for my 10 or 12-year-old? The Rejuvenate, uh, for those that don't know Animate, is our one of our senior formulas. The principal ingredient in Rejuvenate is silver carp. Now, uh, I'm from the Midwest. And we would never feed carp because carp are bottom feeders, right? And so you're always worried about contamination. Silver carp are one of only two species of carp that are actually filter feeders. So guess what they're filtering? They're actually filtering algae, right? So they have a high natural level of omega-3 fatty acids. And it was real interesting. They're actually an invasive species in the United States. Yet when I was doing those lectures in the Czech Republic, as I was driving around, we were seeing all these little fish farms and asking, what are they growing in there? Silver carp. Well, it turns out in Eastern Europe and parts of China, silver carp are a delicacy. In fact, they're an endangered species. But over here in the United States, we can't get anybody to eat them, right? And so they're trying to keep them out of the Great Lakes. And so I was flying somewhere and actually reading the USA Today on the plane and read this article about, some of you might have seen it too, about these flying flying carp in the Illinois River and I and I got intrigued by it and I reached out to the Michigan Department of Natural Resources and asked them about them and they said yeah we'd love to find a use for them so I had them send me a sample and then I sent one to my colleague at one of the vet schools we had it analyzed and it turned out it's the best nutrient analysis we've ever had and part of it is because humans don't want it Guess what we get of that fish? We get the fillets. We get the good parts, right? In other words, in chickens or other lamb or whatever, we're sharing that with humans. But in this, we're not. So we get the best part. So it, it's a great, it's the best raw material. So I'm really high on on that on that um, on that on that fish in the rejuvenate. But not only that, but in the rejuvenate, then you have the turmeric and the um, uh, medium chain triglyceride. So I love the Aqualuck, but I think in this case with an eight year old and an older dog, I think rejuvenates it would be a great addition. Okay. Um, and a few more here. I'm just filtering through. I have a large breed dog and I'm concerned about DCM. What food and or supplement would you recommend? Okay. DCM is dilated cardiomyopathy. And that was uh, 2019. Many of you may have heard of it. They actually came out and thought it might have been associated with. Um, they might have. Been, it might have been associated with grain-free foods. Well, they've since come out and they've looked at 150 studies, and they found that there's really no relationship between dilated cardiomyopathy and grain-free and diet in diet period. There's certain large breed dogs that are just genetically prone to it. 
right? And have a genetic predisposition. The interesting thing is between uh, 0.7 and 1.2% of the dogs in the United States are going to develop dilated cardiomyopathy no matter what. So we're talking just around a million dogs a year are going to develop dilated cardiomyopathy irregardless because of these genetic predispositions. What they found is that the dogs, when they did the FDA did the studies, they found only 560 dogs that they thought might have been diet related. So it's totally insignificant. Okay. All right. So we're going. Now, wait, one more thing. Having said that, um, if you're feeding a diet for a large breed and you're concerned about dilated cardiomyopathy, I would look for things in the diet like make sure there's taurine in it, um, look for L carnitine which has also been associated with dilated cardiomyopathy. Methionine, which is a precursor to taurine, is also a good thing. Those are things you can look at that um, might just give you better uh, a better feeling or what you're trying to do. Okay? Okay. Um, so we're done to our last question here. Can Animate Advance be used when feeding a premium low-temperature cooked kibble? Will it cause an overdose in any vitamin or minerals? Um, it, of course, I don't know the product, but here's what we typically say about um, kibble in, in the hands. Oftentimes, well, actually about 20 to 25 percent of people that use kibble also give their dogs treats that aren't balanced, right? So uh, they're not always getting the right vitamins and minerals that they need. So we've suggested that you could actually go up to a quarter uh, dose of Enhance without worrying about any toxicity. Um, uh, but this is a product, I, I don't know what it is, so I'd have to see some numbers, but typically a quarter a quarter dose would be fine. Okay, well that concludes our Q&A for tonight. Thank you, Robert, and thank you everyone for joining us this evening. We hope you enjoyed the webinar. Um, if you do have any additional questions, you will be able to submit the questions to us and we'll be happy to get your answers from Robert directly. This webinar has been recorded and we posted to Cherry Brook's website in about two days. We really appreciate the uh, presentation tonight, Robert. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. And again, anybody that was here last week, I apologize. And hopefully uh, you learned twice as much. All right. Thanks so much. Have a good evening. Right, thanks a lot, everybody. Have a good evening.